This is a problem I think almost every product person's run into at almost every company they're at, particularly strong at startups where the founders are still in the C-suite mm. because whatever they did to get us here, which may not be what we need to get to the future, seems to have worked. And whatever product things they imagined, somehow we got here, even if it was just luck or survival bias. Delighted to be here today with Rich Miranov. Rich and I know each other from a long time ago um, when he was a product consultant um, for a company that I was working at. And, and Rich has been a product consultant for a, a long time. So he knows the game and is also often an interim product leader. So hello, Rich, and thank you so much for joining the video cast. Right. It's my pleasure, Rachel. Thanks for letting me join in. Along the lines of, of where companies are in maturity in terms of having the data, you know, even if they have the data, what I've seen a lot, and, and of course I'm in product, I've experienced this too, is that you don't always know when you've found the insight that you need, like analytics and doing that work is a lot of, of trying something, having a question, trying to answer it, it'll get you another question, then you try to answer that. How do you kind of know when you've, you've found the insight you're looking for? Yeah, it's a really good question, and, and it's a hard problem, right? So, uh, you know, putting, putting our executive hats on, we'd love to be able to tell our analytics team or our product team that they're going to schedule innovation and they're going to schedule insight, right? So we need two really meaty insights every week to justify the money and the, and the time we're spending on this. And it just isn't that way. This is a lot more like you know, end user discovery or validation where we're going to look and look, but I think, you know, we, we should know what we're looking for, right? So it's helpful to have a hypothesis. I'm going to believe just for the next 10 minutes that there's some correlation or indicator between this user behavior and that outcome or this segment and what's happening, right? I have to, I have to come in with a with a theory, with, with a thought, right? I, I almost never see the data telling us anything or teaching us anything just on the face of it, right? It's, it's almost always obvious if we aren't, if we don't know what we're looking for, right? In fact, um, something I've seen a lot is where a, a brand new, a brand new arrived product manager, somebody's done product elsewhere, but is new to the company, runs a bunch of reports and comes to us and tells us something like, you know, our big customers pay us a lot more than our small customers. <laughs> okay, we knew that. Or um, looks at the, uh, the focus group data and tells us we're a bank that customers would really like lower interest rates on their credit cards, <laughs> right? Which really good to know. Now it's also handy to know that the way the bank makes money is by charging interest. And so we may have some other reasons why we're not just dropping interest rates and giving it away for free, even though somebody said it, right? So, you know, it takes a lot of a hypothesis, a lot of understanding of how the business works, really easy to look at the data and jump to wrong conclusions, right? Uh, and then it's, you know, as you said, it's kind of hunt and peck. It, it's look, it's, and, and then there's this moment that's hard to plan where the light goes on and you, and you see a thing and, and I'm always a little distrustful because if it's a really new thought for me, maybe it's wrong, but in which case I almost always go to somebody who's more junior and smarter than I am to rerun my analysis to see if I've wandered too far, but gosh, you know, we're, we're noticing this thing that folks in the Southeast are using this service a lot more than folks in the Northeast think, 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 what's going on here? Is it weather dependent? Is it culture dependent? Is it, you know, different industries in the Northeast versus the Southeast? Oh gosh, something's going on here. Customer that is driving a lot. That's of right. You know, one big customer who's signing up all of their suppliers. Right? So, so we do, we, we see a thing and then we try to figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes there's a call to the sales team where we say, we're, we're seeing this thing and we don't understand it. Oh, oh, now we understand this really big customer is actually being broken out into 11 smaller companies by their owners, right? By their venture, venture capitals and PE firm. So what used to be one customer is now 11, but it's all the same users, right? 
So, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep chasing this. We're going to go down the rabbit hole until we discover something that matters to the business and is also supported by the data, right? Really hard to plan. Um, if there's, if there's one person on your team, who's really good at this, you know, you might want to let them spend a bunch of wandering time, you know, the whole Google 20% to find out what, you know, work on your own projects, but really smart data folks are rare. And you might set one loose for a few days to see what they come up with. And, and then you got to applaud them, feed them snacks and give them a t-shirt and make them feel important. But um, gosh, it's, it's just hard to plan. I, I, one last thought, and, and then I'll give it back to you. But um, what I find is that insight is hard to define. In fact, it's in the heads of the people we're giving the answers to, right? So something that I think is an insight either is or isn't. When I show it to the rest of the team, they either look at me like I'm stupid, and for me that's often, or they they ask a lot of questions that are interested, right? I, I can't really know if it's an insight unless it turns out to be not something we already know. So so when we're delivering insights to you know somebody down the chain, it's really handy to understand their jobs and what they do and how they see the world. Uh, you know, uh, I was doing some work with an e-commerce company that's having a challenge where if you order a piece of home furnishing that has, that comes in more than one box, comes in five boxes, sometimes it's hard to tell whether you got all the boxes and when they arrived. Now, that's a really important question, which if you're just looking at the per box data, well, how fast did this first box arrive? That's great. But if you need four more to assemble it into something, you know, if you got the if you got the first box of five on Christmas Eve and the last four on New Year's Day, then your kid didn't get a bicycle on Christmas Day, right? And so thinking hard about what the business does and what the end users have as pain is, I think, a great way to, to hunt for the insights. Yeah, one thing we also see a lot, which, which relates to what you're saying, is that... Um, most of what you think to measure or think to look at is the happy path that you've defined. And the insight is actually in the non-happy path. <laughs> Very much. And, and, and I think there's usually both of those cases, right? So, so in one case, we may be trying to improve the average on something, the average onboarding or the average get through the funnel or the average um, time spent in demo before they buy or the, the average whatever. And, and, but but sometimes yeah, it is it's the outliers. If you look at the the eight percent that are the worst or the best, there may be something really different. There may be a whole new market that we have not seen. Um, I did some stuff with uh, with a company that that puts together um, it's it's invoicing software for independent um, investment advisors. So if you were going to go to somebody who's going to run your 401k or your retirement package, they need a bunch of software, right? And it turns out that there's a, a small fraction of those folks who are doing something very different, right? Either they have much larger portfolios or they're, they're trying to do socially responsible investing. And, and you won't see those if you look at the average. But if you look at the, the outliers and ask why they're different, now, often they're just the wrong people and you want to let them go. But, you know, is there a whole segment of uh, socially involved investment managers that we're missing because we didn't think of it and here they are in our data and they're a small group, but, oh gosh, let's run the numbers. Let's find out if there's a thousand of those folks that we just haven't talked to, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, maybe there's not, but again, what, what we're hunting for here is we're hunting for a thing we didn't know. And, and often the outliers are really good. You know, you've got some power users that are able to get past whatever brokenness in your interface. And we don't know how. <laughs> and maybe we can call them up and ask them. You know, they've been making YouTube videos for each other about how to get around our bad UX. <laughs> well, maybe we can pay them money and borrow those videos and send them out to everybody else. I don't know. But back to your point. The insights sometimes come from the average or the median or the, the mean, and sometimes they come from the outliers, and we want to look at both. Yep. So um, you mentioned a little bit earlier executives, and so 
Let's say that you have a pretty good data-driven organization or a product person who's really good at looking at the data and, and making informed decisions. And they, um, they have the, the hippo issue, the highest paid person in the room. Like someone will come in who's an executive, they have an idea. How have you um, recommended in the past that, that people can, can manage this? Yeah, this is, this is a problem I think almost every product person's run into at almost every company they're at, right? And it's, I, I see it particularly strong at startups where the founders are still in the C-suite mm. because whatever they did to get us here, which may not be what we need to get to the future, seems to have worked. And whatever product things they imagine, somehow we got here, even if it was just luck or survival bias, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that's one group. And the other group that's really hard is when it's a heavily sales-driven company. Mm. And by the way, the logic is, how big is the deal? If it's bigger than X, we're going to do what they want. Um, and we're going to put it in the contract. And then we're going to tell product and engineering what we signed up for, right? Mm. Um, so. That. Yeah, I, you know, I've never been there except for every enterprise I've ever worked with. You know, you and I both come from that, that same side of the of the street. Um, so, so you know, part of this I think is to have a lot of empathy for our executives. So, rather than saying grumble, 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 they don't listen to me, they're not data driven, they don't understand product, right? Let Let's first take a moment and remember why they're executives and what happens in their day, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, particularly enterprise B2B executives, the most inputs they get, the first is from their board members and investors who, who are probably polite enough to only call once each day to ask how revenue is going, right? And the answer better be up and to the right. And so every executive is going to be strongly biased towards saying yes to any deal that has money attached. And if we think different, we're not paying attention, right? The second thing is, the calls they get other than that are mostly from either big unhappy customers who have their phone numbers. So we're oversampling on the very highest end customers with big enough problems that went up to some EVP who has the phone number of the CEO and really big deals that need the CEO to make a commitment to close, right? So we're oversampling on the largest deals in both cases. In one case, it's current customers. In the other case, it's prospects. And for whatever reason, we believe exactly what the enterprise sales team tells us about what's going to close the deal. And it's always a new feature, right? Um, so notice that out of that, we didn't sample segments we're not in. Mm -hmm. We didn't sample churned or unhappy customers who didn't complain. We didn't sample small to mediums. We didn't sample anybody who's happy. Right. So going in, you know, we as product folks have to know that our executives are heavily biased away from whatever we're going to bring them. And, you know, if, if they're thoughtful and, and there's an opportunity, I like to have that discussion without any issue on the table. Right. It's really handy for our executives to hear from us that they may have some sampling bias when we're not asking for something. Because otherwise there's motivation issues here. Right. Now then, I think the other really important thing is whenever I'm talking to an exec or I'm playing exec, um, we have to attach money to the things we want, mm -hmm. right? So if improving the top of funnel outreach for live events to get folks to show up and try our stuff is going to put more money in the company, then we have to put them in the same sentence, right? So um, here's why I think we have some bottle of funnel, bottom of funnel improvements that are going to get folks from um, putting things in their shopping cart to buying them, right? That's a great sentence, but it's missing dollars, right? So all good product folks should say, and I think we could have, we could improve, we could reduce um, shopping cart abandonment by six or eight or ten percent. And that's worth 50 million bucks to the company. Mm -hmm. Suddenly everybody's paying attention, right? Ooh, I want to have some of that, right? How do we get there sooner? Well, you know, we have to run some experiments. We got to pull some data. We, we want to do a one or 2% 
you know, cut over because we're really not sure. But if this one goes well, we think it's between 20 and 40 million this year for the company, right? Wow, we're sitting up. And that's really, that's actually doubly useful when that very same executive comes to me about four hours later, assuming we had the morning discussion, it's now the afternoon, right? Saying, I just got off the phone from a big customer and all they want is this little tiny enhancement, right? You know my joke here, right? The enhancement they want is teleportation, Yeah. right? Um, uh, we didn't think it was a big deal. We figured it's 10 lines of code. You can get it done and stick it in the sprint. So we wrote it into the contract, right? That's my opportunity or my product manager's opportunity to say, hmm, we could work on this, but we're going to have to take the people off of the thing we agreed this morning was going to be worth 20 to $40 million to the company. And I'm looking and I'm thinking this is a $50,000 deal and I'll do whatever you want because you're the exec. But my simple math tells me that $40 million is bigger than $50,000. So are you really sure that you want me to abandon the thing we just started, right? Because again, on the executive side, the rewards are mostly measured in money. And if we're gonna pull a feature out that we've announced to the world that 500 of our customers are waiting for, and it's gonna lead to a lot of upsell and reduced churn, uh, you didn't hear me attach a number to it yet, right? I better know that that's a 10 or a 15 or hundred million dollar improvement mm -hmm. uh, because the only thing that wins here is a bigger number, right? By the way, I'm going to hide all the tech debt and all of the infrastructure and all the scalability and all the security work out of sight. So we don't trade those off, but right. One versus another. Well, mine is bigger than yours as we're, we're talking about revenue here, right? So, you know, that, that brings up a really good question and something I've been thinking about a lot which is um, I think especially at a, especially at SaaS companies, maybe less at e-commerce, but I think it also happens there too. Um, you sometimes get into this mode of, we need the next new big feature. We need to work on all the new things. Right. But sometimes you can actually generate more value by fixing or improving existing things. And so how do you think about, you know, the right balance of investment there? Really good question, Rachel. And I think you hit exactly the right words, which was investment and balance. Because it's clear that if we put 100% of our effort against just fixing bugs, our customers are going to be happy, but it's going to be hard to sell to new customers. And if we put 100% of our effort against some new shiny feature, well, churn's going to go up. Current customers are going to be unhappy. We're going to not fix infrastructure and scalability and all the things. And, you know, I never want to be at the company that runs out of scalability and can't process whatever our customers are doing, right? So, so there's a mix here. And I think it's really a strategic call. You know, how, what's our quality situation? What's our infrastructure situation? Are we entering a new market? We're going to want to make sort of big allocations um, in, in a typical enterprise company, I'm usually expecting about half of all the engineering effort. I don't care if that's story points or engineering weeks or strawberries or whatever we're counting, right? But about half against visible features that customers ask for. You know, new workflows, um, new reports, new integrations, uh, shiny new stuff, right? So marketing is always excited when we do something shiny and exciting. So there's always a push for oh, I don't know, blockchain or Bitcoin or machine learning or whatever sounds cool, because that's going to get folks top of funnel into our webinar or into our reading our email. But if that's not important to our end customers, that's, that's fictitious. That, that's not going to be handy, right? So, so we're going to, I think we're going to feel the company pulling us in a lot of directions. And so I really like to start before we get into the I want X down at the ticket level. I like to have a strategic allocation that says, look, half the budget is for outward facing features and we'll have a fist fight every quarter about big versus little and market versus market. And then a third is for maintenance, illities, security, all the other stuff. And then we have to keep a little bit for discovery and validation, of course. And if we're an enterprise company, there's a couple of specials that are gonna come in no matter what we do. Right. So, so if we 
if we divide it up that way, now we can have more sensible prioritization within those different slices of the pie, right? I never want to trade off all the bug fixes for one shiny new thing because I'll pay for it later. So you mentioned ill at ease. Where do you put usability? You know, and I ask because uh, like in the world of, you know, product-led growth or, you know, like you're, you're often making small improvements to help users be more successful with your product. They can technically be sometimes new things, but they're, they're more around just making the core functionality easier to use. Like, where do you slot that? Yeah. And it's a mixed bag, right? So, so some things that we're going to do on usability are obvious or visible or going to have a direct impact. And some of them we have to do to fix problems that nobody's complaining about, but, but that we can see, right? And so um, I would describe this much more as a political discussion than a technical discussion, because as the head of product, what I want to do is I want to get a lot of usability done. And sometimes I can sell pieces of that to the business side. In which case we can put them on the features half. And in some cases I can't, and then we're going to sneak them in on the other side. Um, if it lines up against an OKR or an outcome, much easier to do, right? Um, but we really don't want to burden the business side, the go-to-market side with every little bit of UX. Um, here, here's a, a good example. And, and I'm forgetting the, the name of the woman who gave this really good talk. I'll try to look it up and send it to you later. But uh, I heard a woman from Netflix give a really good talk about um, the, the page where you put in your name and address and credit card information to sign up for Netflix. And who knew that was a thing? I'm not a designer. I'm not so smart. But it turns out that a lot of good designers know that if you, if, at least in the US, if you move the zip code or the postal code ahead of city and state, it turns out you can fill in city and state for them. Right? And a lot of people can't complete the form correctly with both city and state and the correct zip code. And they drop out and they don't sign up for Netflix because they they can't get through the UX, right? And some really good um, analysis of where people are dropping out and what errors they're having um, is, is really handy there. And it turns out if you move the zip code ahead, you get significantly better signup numbers at that step in the process. Now, where does that go? I don't know. I don't care. But I know it needs to happen. So, so if we have some big OKR around getting folks through the funnel faster, well, then maybe we get to put it on that list, but it seems important. So, so my product team and UX team and I are going to design team are going to find some place to stick that because it's going to have a really good impact. And we may plead ignorance as to why it was on one side or the other. So Rich, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I know that you do lots of talks and you've written a lot on, on you know, these topics that we talked about as well as much more stuff. Where can people find out more? Well, I, I've cleverly managed to get my last name as my domain. Um, and it has, uh, at this point, 20 years of blog posts. I started blogging in 2001 because that's when blogs really arrived. And there's probably, I don't know, 80 or 100 recorded talks and whatever. So I just encourage folks to come to my site, take anything that's useful. It's all free. And, uh, and hopefully they'll find some insights, which, of course, I can't know until they tell me it was something new that they didn't know before. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Oh, my pleasure. And, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.